I'm Tim Stanton. Um, I'm at the Moss Landing Marine Labs and the Naval Postgraduate School as an Emeritus Professor. And we've just deployed the distributed network as a component of the Mosaic project in the Central Arctic. Uh, I'm going to be uh, giving a lecture on the um, ice-ocean atmosphere coupling and um, I hope you enjoy that. Well, we've just come in from the after the uh, academic feder off where we took the first part into a nice warm uh, meeting room. And I'm going to be talking about the ocean atmosphere coupling in the Arctic and posing the question, how does the presence or absence of ice change the connections between the atmosphere and ocean? So very briefly, the outline is looking at the way wind couples to ocean currents how vertical heat transport between the ocean and atmosphere uh, is moderated by the ice and how solar radiation enters the ocean in the presence or absence of ice and touch on the ice albedo feedback which is very important in the central Arctic these days and then mix in a few slides uh, looking at mosaic measurements of these processes. So wind forcing of the ocean is a very important thing in driving surface currents and mixing in the ocean. So when the wind blows over a surface, the amount of its momentum, which is simply the mass times the speed of the wind that passes to the surface depends on the surface roughness. Now surprisingly, the ice covered ocean is much smoother than the open ocean with waves on it. So we can expect stronger wind driven currents in the central Arctic during late summer when there's more open water conditions. That has quite a few ramifications, um, particularly as we go to a more uh, ice-free condition for longer times in the Arctic. This diagram shows paths for the uh, heat to and from the ice. It's sort of a cartoon version trying to summarize the various ways that heat can get into the upper ocean. And the first thing is the sensible and latent heats. That's the evaporative heat, for example, heat loss when the water evaporates is the, a latent heat. Um, term and then the atmospheric sensible heat is just when the atmosphere for example is colder than the ocean which is very typical we lose heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. A very important thing in the summer is the solar radiation input into the ocean and that's really quite tricky it uh, depends on the reflectivity of the surface presence and absence of melt ponds and many other factors which greatly complicate that um, when we particularly when we try to model it. And the last term I want to bring up is the small heat flux that comes from the heat contained deeper within the ocean, primarily from inputs from the Pacific and the Beaufort Gyre and the Atlantic water coming in from the other side of the basin, for example, where the mosaic side is on the Siberian side of the basin, this becomes important. But it's not very available heat and we're going to discuss that in, a, in another talk. So heat transport between the atmosphere and ocean uh, moderated by ice, you, you need to consider the following factors. Ice is a fairly good thermal insulator, so as soon as ice begins to form, the transfer of heat from the relatively warm ocean, which is always very close to the freezing point if there's ice around, in this case about minus 1.9 degrees centigrade, to the atmosphere, which can be anything from minus 5 to minus 40 degrees C, um, is rapidly decreased. Now snow is a very good insulator, so even a few centimeters of snow significantly reduces the conduction of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. Even if the ice is doing a pretty good job, that snow just kills it. So the presence of ice and snow greatly reduces the thermal coupling between the ocean and atmosphere. In cold winter conditions, openings in the ice, which are called leads, expose warm ocean water at the local freezing point again to the very cold atmosphere and can cause very large heat losses to the atmosphere um, over these local areas. And it really depends on the size of the lead to work out whether these are significant or not. Turns out they are really in the heat balance when we consider a whole annual cycle. Ice is highly reflective to incoming solar radiation or sunlight with about 60% of the light being reflected. Snow is even more reflective with 95% of the light reflected and the albedo is simply the fraction of reflected sunlight, for example, 0.95 for fresh snow. However, open water absor absorbs about 94% of the incoming heat with 6% reflected. This makes the Arctic ice pack very sensitive to the amount of open water there is in a given area. The open water fraction 
and leads to the important ice albedo feedback that contributes to rapid late summer ice melt. So the ice albedo feedback is an extension of what I just said. The big difference between snow and ice albedo, illustrated in the left-hand panel, and the low albedo of the water in the right-hand section of that figure, um, showing that just about all the incoming solar radiation enters the ocean. And this gives rise to a feedback. So let's consider we, in the mid-season and the mid-summer, we start to get some melt ponds and some open water forming. So we melt some ice, we cause some fresh water to be um, generated. Um, we lower the albedo because that open water now absorbs a lot of solar radiation. Now we increase the absorbed sunlight into the ocean and that causes more melting of the sea ice and around we go. So it's a positive feedback and you really do see this playing out in the central Arctic in the summer to the extent that we really get rid of just about all the ice in the Beaufort Sea now by late summer. And this is something we do not entirely understand, that basic uh, paradigm is playing out, but when we model it, we fail to get quite the rapid retreat that we actually observe. This is illustrated here in a a uh, photo of the Sheba ice camp taken in fall in 1997 with the hotel ship behind and the ice camp in front and you can see snow covered ice and no holes in it, just happy people wandering around. Whereas a year later or nine months later in late summer of 98, you can see on the right hand side all the melt ponds and the melted out areas surrounding the ship, making it very challenging to work. And this is very typical again, even back in the 90s, late 90s, this was playing out and it's playing out even more these days because the ice retreat is even more rapid by late summer. So I'm going to just show two examples of ocean ice atmospheric measurements in mosaic. The ocean flux is just below the ice, which is something that I specialize in and then conductive fluxes in the ice, which we make at a number of sites because there's actually quite a lot of variability depending on snow depth and ice type. And I'll just quickly show one example of the atmospheric flux measurements and solar radiation measurements that are very important in understanding the surface forcing of that system. So I'm gonna describe the autonomous ocean flux buoy system, which is my specialty and com contribution to the Mosaic project. There's a schematic on the left that shows from the top down an acoustic Doppler profiler that measures current profiles down to about 80 meters depth, a flux package that measures the transport of heat, salt and momentum between the ocean and the ice, measured about two to three meters below the ice, and then below that um, some, a pectocline spar which I'll describe in a different lecture. So the AOFB measures heat, salt and momentum fluxes and the formation and melt of ice locally and because it's on a carriage system, that sensor package can move up and down about three meters below the ice and measure temperature, salinity, and biological properties, including chlorophyll and dissolved organic matter and turbidity, which is very important in the late summer in understanding the way that solar energy is trapped in the upper ocean. And it also measures the local ice space changes and roughness um, in that system. The other system I'm gonna show is a Nice simple system, it's an ice conductive um, heat transport measurement, which is simply a set of um, temperature sensors going from the atmosphere through the snow down into the ice and out into the ocean. It measures the ice thickness, the snow depth, and by knowing the conduct thermal conductivity of the ice, you can infer the actual heat conducted through that system. So I hope that um, you will show some interest in these measurements and observations as we go through this next year. We hope to get a full year of these measurements as the whole system drifts out towards the Northern Atlantic Ocean.